Roxy for choosing the wettest day of the year to choose a, a seminar. Thanks very much. Uh, so, yeah, my name's Mark Bramage. I'm Director General of the EIS uh, Association. So I'm going to talk to you today about using independent reviews, or, or rather I'm not actually. Um, what I want to do is just go back a couple of steps, because at the end of the day, what is an independent review? It's basically a piece of research and due diligence. So I just want to go back a couple of places and look at the whole context of research and diligence and where this stuff fits into the bigger picture of uh, how we do this stuff. So trying to look at why it's important to do research and due diligence, trying to look at uh, what the difference is between research and due diligence, because I think there is quite a big difference between those two things. I think it's important to understand what, how that works. And then thirdly, just trying to use my experience uh, as a former IFA, so I used to be head of research for a financial planning firm, uh, Mazars Financial Planning. And when we started to look at this stuff, we, when we started to look at our research and, and DD processes, is we were pretty infrequent, pretty inconsistent in what we did. It's pretty much done on an ad hoc basis, really. So we went from doing not a lot to doing quite a lot. Uh, and that brought some real positive benefits to the business and, more importantly, to clients as well. So I think it's important to try and share that with you guys as well. Uh, so one of the first things I want to do is talk about and try and steal everyone else's funder, actually, because I'm sure they're going to talk about it as well. And let's talk about TR161, which is the paper that the FCA did back in, uh, back in a year or so ago. So the headline from this, and again, try not to steal too much funding from these guys, is that the headline figure was the primary cause of poor uh, client outcomes was poor DD processes. So before we take, undertake any research or due diligence, it's, uh, it's important to understand why we're doing it and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, and one of the things we uh, did at Mazars was trying to get this five-stage process in place. There we go. Um, so this really helped us to kind of set the agenda for where we were going with R&D processes. So the key jumping off point for, for any R&D is basically the current and future strategy and vision of the business. This sets the scope for everything else that follows and ensures that the R&D work is then aligned to your strategic goals. For researcher, there's no point doing a whole host of work, uh, trying to put a load of effort in, trying to find the next big product or proposition that your clients and your, your, financial, your planners might want to use, because all that work can go to waste if that's not aligned to what the strategic goals of the firm are. Uh, so you can waste a lot of time doing that stuff, but make sure it fits in with what the wider business is trying to do, what the wider business is trying to achieve. When we joined Mazars, or when I joined Mazars, I say, we did very little with IS planning. And actually, what drove it forward was doing a client segmentation exercise that made us realize we had the client base that was appropriate for this stuff. So we had clients with the right age, who had the right assets and liabilities, who had the right tax liabilities, who had the right risk profile, most importantly. As I say, that really drove us towards doing a lot more uh, work in this area. So we need to have a business case. We need to be able to crunch the numbers to prove that there's, a, there's some um, new business that will come in from all this stuff and to ensure that the senior manager have buy-in before we go ahead. So the next stage uh, to help deliver those strategic goals uh, is to create service propositions. Now, service proposition is uh, often an area of advice, such as at retirement, or in this instance, tax efficient investing. And in order to define the outcome we're seeking to achieve here, it's important to establish measurable objectives. Once we establish those objectives, we can then set a criteria of how we want to achieve those objectives. So for example, uh, one of the outcomes we might want to see, see uh, achieve for a tax efficient investment proposition might be that you ensure that you get your clients' tax certificates back very quickly to them so they can get their tax relief uh, quickly and efficiently. A measurable objective, therefore, would be to ensure that clients get their EIS3 certificates back within a certain number of months, and that would be up for you guys to choose what that number of months would be. It might be three, it might be six, it might be nine, it might be 12. Again, it's your choice to choose what that X number of months is. So to achieve that objective, one of your research criteria might be that you select only EIS single companies or funds that have a track record of delivering EIS free certificates within that specific time span. By doing this, you can really quite quickly and quite easily filter down the whole product universe, which might be 30 or 40 products, into a product panel or a selection of products that fit your criteria. So that might be two or three EISs out of 30 that fit that criteria. It might be 10 or 15, but at least you've chosen your own set of criteria for choosing that panel. So research and diligence is only useful when we conduct it against this backdrop. Every firm, and there's probably 15, 20 firms different in the room here, probably have their own idea of how to get those, uh, what their strategy management will be and what they want to focus on, to whom they want to focus it to, and how they want to deliver it. But once identified and communicated, R&D can be uh, aligned accordingly. So research and diligence in a financial planning context are uh, often taken to be the same thing, but in my view, there is a difference. So I think it's really important to try and flesh that out a little bit. <coughs> so research 
should assess how the characteristics and features of a product can be used to help a firm deliver those defined outcomes we just talked about. <laughs> and for me, for EIS, I should probably cover these things here. So it's probably 10 or 12 things, different things there. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them one by one, but just try and pick out a couple of them. Management experience, uh, I think that's always important. So people who have been there, have done it before, can show you that they've got the experience in that particular sector. Uh, that's always a real key indicator when looking at an EIS fund or, or an investee company. Downside protection and upside potential, two conflicting things there in some way. So for many EISs, uh, they're trying to just mitigate the risks. They're trying to downplay the risks as much as possible. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got AISs that are trying to go for super growth uh, and make as much returns as possible. Again, for a firm, you need to decide kind of which end of that spectrum you're going to be, whether you're going to be a little bit of both, whether you're going to be in the middle, whether you're going to be one end or the other end. But you need to talk to your clients, talk to your planners, and see what you're comfortable doing and advising in that area. Deal flow is always a big one. Uh, if you're investing in a, a fund particularly, and that fund only has one or two areas of deal flow, you need to think what happens if that deal flow gets cut off. Where they're going to go to next? Do they have anywhere else? Where they can get investee companies? Are they still going to be able to make good investments on behalf of you and your clients? Uh, track record's always a big one as well. So again, have they been there? Have they done it? Have they had, more importantly, have they got out of the EIS before? One of the biggest criticisms you can have for EIS funds is that you go into a fund, you sit in it three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, and all of a sudden you can't get your, money, your clients' money out. So you need to have EISs that have a track record of returning money to clients. Due diligence then is an analysis of the organisation delivering the said products to consider whether it's a viable commercial entity. At its most basic level, the risk is that the organisation can't do what it said it would do and defaults in some form. So due diligence, therefore, attempts to identify whether that risk exists and to what extent. It also covers potential conflicts of interest between the parties involved, also including perhaps between yourselves and supplier firms. So research should be... Uh, an so research and due diligence story should be a package, a belt and braces approach. Research looking at the product, due diligence looking at the product provider. This is a risk-based approach that should then give you a best solution to your desired outcomes that we talked about earlier, while also minimizing your business risk. Good research and due diligence helps you ensure you're, cho you're choosing the right product, both for your client and for your business. So you need to be confident you're asking the right questions for your clients and can demonstrate back to the regulator how you made your decision. You need to make it crystal clear to anyone who cares to ask the question how you made your decisions and what the evidence you have to back it up. So you've got a proven audit trail. By doing this, our research and diligence is undertaken within a risk framework and risk to both yourselves and your clients is contained and minimized. If things do go wrong, well-documented R&D will enable you to justify the decisions you made at the time and should be able to reduce both reputational and financial risk. And again, just for example, when uh, we were at Mazars, when we started to do EIS um, on any kind of grand scale, initially we were doing it with just one provider. So, uh, so we looked at that and thought, well, hang on, this is a reputational risk, there's a concentration risk here, there's a provider risk here. Um, so we started to move out a little bit and try to have more providers on our panels, trying to get, encourage our planners to uh, invest their clients' money in different EISs. And thankfully, uh, we did have a couple of EISs a couple of years ago that um, didn't go very well, should we say. So they lost clients' money. Uh, they obviously weren't very happy. They're coming to us asking questions. Actually, thinking back, none of them complained because uh, we managed to set expectation levels at the right level for clients. But the point being, we had probably seven or eight clients who weren't happy at that time. If we'd have just done it with one provider, and that particular provider, we probably have had 30, 40 clients who weren't very happy, and we probably would have had complaints. So we managed to try and ring fence some of that risk uh, and also at the same time, obviously, reduce our reputation risk, therefore. But it's not just about risk also, it's also about good, business, good, sorry, good business practice. An effective R&D process should leave both your clients and you in a better position than before the process is undertaken. So this might include a reduction in risk, it should also include other areas such as improved efficiencies, improved processes, improved client experiences, and hopefully lower costs also. Clearly, all of these relate back to the objectives we talked about earlier and the desired outcomes we're seeking to achieve. So research and development is a full circle 360 exercise that steps back and looks at provider in its entirety and not just in isolation. The benefits are tangible both to your clients and for your own business. Finally then, just want to look at some of these areas, which are pretty much a do and don'ts for, uh, for advising in this area. 
That's the last one. So hopefully this kind of acts as a checklist. And when we talked about independent reviews earlier, this is where we'll probably come into the to looking at this uh, most openly. So the first thing, if I can encourage you to do anything, it would be to do it yourself. Don't just rely on independent reviews, as good as most of them are. Uh, you need to, as I say, set your own criteria. You need to understand why you're doing this stuff. You need to ask the questions that you want to ask. Otherwise, you just get someone else's opinion. You don't get your own opinion. You know what your clients are. You know uh, your financial planners are and what questions they want to ask. So ask your own questions. Do your own questionnaires. Uh, and get them to fill them in. Don't rely on their questionnaires also. Many US funds these days will send out their own questionnaire. Please don't rely on those. Please ask your own questions at that point. Uh, second point is don't rely on third parties. So yeah, there's some really good uh, reviewers out there. Hardman's, for example, Annenbridge, MyCap, Martin Churchill. They do some really good analysis. They have some really good opinions in there. But they can't just rely on their opinions. Russell talks about scoring earlier. I know this is a, a touchy subject in the independent review market, whether to score or not to score. Um, but the point is, you can look at a score. I wouldn't rely on a score. The more important this issue is to look at the methodology of that scoring so you understand how that number came about. Because a number is only a number if you know how, how understand how it came about. Um, I'm an Ipswich Town fan. I see a lot of nil-nil draws at Ipswich. It's pretty boring most of the time. But if I haven't seen the game, I don't understand how the score came about. So it's similar in the independent research area as well. We've talked about set your own criteria, so you need to understand what you're trying to achieve with this stuff and what criteria you're, you're looking at. I took over an example there, talking about tax relief and tax certificates. That's just one criteria. You probably want to think about having 5, 10, 15, 20 such, such criteria to try and give you that, that panel that we talked about earlier. Uh, finally there, don't follow the crowds. So yeah, again, it's very easy just to pick out the, the biggest names in this industry and try and invest with those guys in the hope that they'll give you the biggest returns. The likelihood that they won't um, you need to do more than one, trying to get a portfolio of this stuff. Most of the analysis that I see says that if you can invest across uh, uh, up to sort of 10 or 12 different EIS or certainly different EIS companies, then you're getting more of a portfolio effect. So there's under correlated risks, you're reducing the risk, certainly getting no money back uh, and hopefully getting some significant returns back. Ask the questions they don't want you to ask. So again, uh, as we talked about earlier, they'll provide you with questions that they want you to know, but you need to ask those questions that you want to know. So often providers, particularly uh, EOS providers, don't like being asked about track record, for example, or performance. So that's probably a good starting point to, uh, to quiz them on. We talked about not relying on one manager, try and spread it around a little bit. Um, there's some great managers out there, but yeah, don't just do it with one person or don't just do it with the big boys, try and, try and spread it around. Keep it under review. So yeah, times change, uh, particularly in the ice market as we get towards uh, tax year end, for example, EIS funds tend to fill up quite quickly, particularly the, the popular ones. So you need to keep looking at this stuff, keep checking that the, this is appropriate for your client base. Uh, they still want to invest in this area. They're looking at different areas they want to invest in. So just really try and keep it all under review. And then finally, they're trying to keep an audit trail. So again, this is really uh, for the regulator, for your own business, again, you can if anyone does ask you questions of why you're uh, recommending this particular AIS fund or why you're doing uh, the, the processes that you're doing, you have an audit trail there. It's all on your system, probably on your back office system that you can explain to someone that this is how you did it and this is why you did it. And if a complaint does come back in a couple of years' time, then hopefully you should be able to justify that. And that's pretty much it.